Welcome back and we're live on Sahara TV. He's a lawyer by profession, a Christian leader, a family man, and a politician. He's a founding member of the Movement for Democratic Change Party and also the founding secretary for legal affairs in a faction that's led by Welshman Nube in the MDC. He was also the MP for Bulawayo South in the House of Assembly from 2000 to 2008 and was also elected senator in 2008. Honorable Senator David Coulter is also Minister of Education, Sport, Art and Culture within Zimbabwe's government. And it's been three years since the Unity Government has been formed. Welcome to Sahara TV, Minister. Hi, it's good to be with you. Thank you. Now, with the tremendous brain drain within the last decade, lack of resources, a fledging economy, and uncertain political environment that has seen Zimbabwe shift from good to bad to ugly, sometimes very, very ugly, and what is now become better in some other, uh, you know, statements that people are giving us. What is your take after 32 years of independence amidst the, all the continuing strikes in, you know, the civil society? Well, I think that um, we've got to see Zimbabwe in the context of other nations and uh, all nations go through certain seasons. If you were an American living in the 1860s, uh, you would have lived through pretty traumatic times. Uh, likewise, of course, if you were an, an African-American living in Birmingham, Alabama in the 1960s, uh, you would have lived through pretty terrible times. And we have to see the last 32 years post-independence in Zimbabwe is uh, one of these seasons of a country which is um, in a process of transition, going from white minority rule and all the oppression that came with colonial rule, uh, uh, adjusting to that, uh, recovering from a very brutal war. And uh, it's been difficult, but I... I believe that in, in some respects it was almost inevitable that the nation would go through that. It's a legacy of that war. And I think that we now, we're now moving into a, a new, more enlightened era. Okay, and of so course, uh, I was going to say at this point where we're in this, uh, maybe the third year of the transition government, what do you think... Uh, is going to be the outcome of uh, everything going on. I mean, we've had, obviously, in our history, the worst uh, inflation uh, that the world has actually ever seen. And we've had high unemployment. We've had uh, gross human rights abuses. We've had, uh, you know, price hikes. So where is Zimbabwe heading to at this point? I know we have pending elections coming through. And there's been a squabble between the two ruling parties within the unity government. Uh, so where do you see Zimbabwe heading to this, with all that background? Well, I think that uh, we mustn't be naive. Uh, we're still in a very fragile process of transition. And there are hardliners out there within the military, some within ZANU-PF, who don't like this process of transition and who may derail it. Uh, even now, and th that will set the whole nation back, and it's, it is a worry. But I think that if uh, the rational people, the moderate people involved in the inclusive government, and I include many in ZANU-PF in that regard, have their way, then this process will continue. We will eventually reach agreement regarding a new constitution. Uh, we will reach agreement regarding electoral changes, and, and there will be uh, elections. I, I don't believe that those elections will be perfect. Far from it. Uh, that's naive to, to expect that that will happen. Okay, Rico. But I think that uh, that's likely thing. Okay, I mean, regarding this new constitution, I believe there was a draft that was handed out last week, and uh, this draft has been uh, on the table for almost two years. What has been the problem, and what is the outcome of this constitution? Because one side, which is the MDC, 
saying that we're not going to have elections until this new constitution has been obviously come through. And one side saying, okay, we're going to have elections this year anyhow. What has, what came out of this draft constitution? What's, where do we stand on that? The draft constitution is obviously way behind schedule, but we now do have a first working draft, which is an achievement in itself. Uh, the constitutional reform process reflects the macro political situation where you've got hardliners, uh, some hardliners in ZANU who do not uh, want a new constitution, recognize that uh, it will reduce their powers and, and usher in a different era. And so they are fighting tooth and nail to prevent that new constitution from coming uh, into force. But the bottom line is that both of the MDC formations and a substantial group of moderate ZANU PF people understand that as, fl as flawed as this process is, it remains the only viable option open to Zimbabweans. And I, I think that um, when you hear of the likes of Jonathan Moyer and others trashing the Constitution, that's a statement of desperation. But they don't re represent the majority of you within the country or even within ZANU-PF. Right. And so I think that despite all that rhetoric, we will muddle through, we will get through to a new Constitution. Okay, now when you mention the word hardliners, you're actually talking about uh, people within the establishment of the ruling party, and I'm talking of ZANU PF. Uh, these people who really are not supporting democracy and are not really prepared to see that change happens in, in Zimbabwe. Now, we know that the international world and everybody who was against what was going on in Zimbabwe had um, supported sanctions. And in fact, they did, uh, you know, apply sanctions in Zimbabwe that restricted, uh, you know, uh, movement uh, of the people involved that also uh, froze assets and stuff like that. But you have been quoted to have repeatedly argued that the use of sanctions in Zimbabwe, uh, claiming that they are ineffective and that the international community should support the transitional government as Zimbabwe's only viable non-violent route towards a more democratic society. Is this still your sentiments? Absolutely. I, uh, I come back to the, the notion of seasons. There, there was a time when uh, these measures were necessary. There were rampant human rights abuses. There was no uh, compromise. Uh, people were being disappeared. People were being tortured. And it was important that the international community uh, impose measures to express their disapproval of what was going on and to to make those responsible for those human rights abuses uh, aware that there were consequences for their actions. But we are in a different era now. Uh, although we still got hardliners, there are many uh, moderate ZANU-PF people who, uh, whilst I don't agree with their policy outlook, are at least committed to this process. And we have achieved remarkable changes in the last three years. Uh, it is objectively verifiable that there are far fewer human rights abuses, there are far fewer people in detention, far fewer people being tortured. There are at least two independent daily, daily newspapers uh, sold in our streets that weren't there three years ago. The education sector is being transformed, the health sector is being transformed. We've recently ratified the International Convention Against Torture. These are all objective factors, and it indicates that we are moving forward. And none of us argue that this is a perfect arrangement. None of us uh, argue that there's any absolute guarantee that this will work. But where you can see a peaceful process unfolding, the international community has an obligation to assist that process, and they must now remove these measures. The irony for me is that the group that most benefits from the continued imposition of these measures uh, is the, the group of hardliners right. who deliberately act provocatively, 
uh, in a way to ensure that there's outrage in the West and keep these uh, measures in place. And then, of course, they, they use the continuation of the measures as an excuse for not implementing key aspects of the agreement. So my argument is remove them. They don't serve any useful purpose now. Take the wind out of the sails of, of these hardliners. Right. Now, uh, you were a lawyer by profession. You're actually a lawyer by profession. And I know that in your past, you've actually worked yeah, working on cases like the Gukura Hundi where obviously over 20,000 people were massacred, that genocide in Matabeleland. And you presided over some of these cases. And fast forward to this day, and I know sometime in February you actually lost somebody you tweeted and said, a very, I'm, I'm very distressed about the disappearance of a good friend and colleague, and that was Paul Chizuze, who was uh, somebody that you'd been working very closely with. Uh, what exactly happened in this case? And do you have any leads to as to what might have happened to him? Paul Chizuze is one of my oldest uh, friends and work colleagues. Uh, we go back to the 1980s when he was working with the Catholic Commission for Justice and Peace, and I was instructed as a young lawyer to represent um, human rights victims who were being assisted by the Catholic Commission. So I've known him for many, many years. He was also one of the first uh, people we trained as a paralegal in the Legal Resources Foundation. And when I've had difficulties, he, he was there for me when Patrick Nabanyama one of my polling agents was abducted on the 19th of June 2000. Right. It was Chizuze who, who ran around Bulawayo and visited police stations and tried to find uh, Patrick. Sadly, Patrick was never found. Right. Um, so Paul is a remarkable human being, a wonderful person, a man of deep compassion, of absolute integrity. And he disappeared on the 8th of February this year. Um, and we've we've never seen him again. Now Sad we don't know. That. We don't know what has caused uh, this disappearance. I pray that he is still alive. Uh, but obviously, as every week goes by, that the chances of us finding him alive uh, diminish. Uh, and I have no doubt that if he has been abducted, and and if people have done terrible things to him, that once again this will be the work of, of these same group of hardliners. So, uh, so obviously, it's, uh, I, I guess this is obviously one of your top priorities in the sense that once you there's change of power, these kind of atrocities will be addressed. And also, hopefully, that the people that are responsible to have been committing these crimes or allowing these crimes to, to, to happen will be prosecuted. Is that something that... Uh, people are being told about and being warned about to know that there are consequences of from from this kind of behavior. Well, you know, aside from whatever we do, uh, I, I have a deep faith. I believe uh, that there's a God of justice uh, who judges everyone ultimately, right. uh, and and I often say that uh, that um, irrespective of what we in this life are able to do, those people responsible for these terrible things are going to face judgment. They better face up to, to that reality. But of course, even in this life, um, we, we strive to, to, to hold people accountable. A key point, though, is, is that uh, politicians and lawyers and others should not be dictating what should happen regarding uh, a truth telling and 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 justice and reconciliation. Uh, ultimately, it is for victims right. to do that. And so, our policy is that we we believe that the first stage in in this process is to have a truth telling. Okay. Let, so, so I know I know that obvious. Quickly, let, let victims say what happened to them, and also let them tell us what they want to happen regarding prosecutions and and justice and reconciliation and then when we've heard from them we can say whether there'll be prosecutions I, I etc. Think, I think it's obvious to say that there's no way a truth and reconciliation 
uh, comedy can be created at this point when the government and the economy is not stable. We don't know exactly what's going to come out of any election, maybe say tomorrow or next year. So I think that uh, case, but I guess they're being documented. These cases are being documented. Is there a place where people can go and register or speak up and say, okay, you know, this is what's going on. Even if nothing is being done about it now, hopefully sometime in the future, this will be able to be oh, of course. addressed. Absolutely. Uh, you know, we worked hard in the 1990s uh, to document what happened during the Kukuruhundi, and we've, in, in that time, we recorded well over 2,000 statements from victims. And those statements are safely held outside of the country. Um, and none of the perpetrators will ever get their hands on those documents. Um, and, and so they, they are a historical record. I know that um, human rights organizations in the last 12 years have been uh, documenting abuses. They're, they're increasingly in this world, there's no place to hide for human rights ab abusers. Um, but obviously it takes time. But, you know, let me come back to this uh, transition. It, it is right. very important that we get through this transition for all the lives that have been lost um, in the last 50 years in this country, it is important that we do everything now to ensure that we lessen the, lo the, the loss of life in, in future. And sometimes to lessen further loss of life, one, one has to make compromises. Uh, right. Often they are unsatisfactory, but you need to make those compromises to save lives in, in future. For example, I have no doubt that had we not agreed to this inclusive government, that uh, hundreds of thousands of people who, are suffering from, who were suffering from cholera uh, in December 2008 uh, would have died. The, the cholera epidemic uh, would not have uh, been dealt with. Thank you. So we're just going to... So right, right. Thank you. Sorry to cut you short. We're just going to round up. Now, I know that there's been a discovery of these diamonds that have been controversial, obviously called uh, the Marangi Diamonds, and uh, there's been, they, they've been associated with corruption and human rights abuses, at, and at some point, 2008, the international uh, markets uh, banned them from being exported. So I believe it's that, that, that has also been lifted now, that ban. So has there been any kind of transparency in how this diamond industry has been operating? And if not, what is there in place to make it more transparent? Because every Zimbabwean and everybody else who is aware that uh, these diamond deposits that have been discovered are good enough to feed Zimbabwe and, you know, jumpstart its economy. So is there been any transparency? The entire diamond sector in this country uh, has been... Um, shadowed in a lot of the obscurity and opaqueness and it's still nowhere near transparent enough for my liking uh, and once again I think you've got to see this uh, as a process of tron of transition uh, it, it's one of the very unsatisfactory aspects of Zimbabwe at present we have this massive uh, resource which should be used for the benefit of all Zimbabweans uh, we've seen very um, limited revenues flowing from the, the diamond fields that uh, would certainly help the health and education sectors. Uh, we are doing all in our power to uh, introduce new legislation and new policies to, to make uh, the sector more transparent and more accountable. Um, but we've got a lot of work to, to do still in, in that regard. Okay. Yeah, now we're going to leave, and thank you very much for coming on to our show. And I believe that you're going to be traveling to the United States uh, soon, and I wish you a safe trip. And I also heard that you uh, there's going to be a film showing somewhere in the United States, the first premiere of a film called Robert Mugabe, What Happened? And this is going to be at NYIT, and that's going to be on a Thursday, which is May 17th from 630 
and everybody I think is welcome. This is basically, I think, in order to generate dialogue amongst Zimbabweans and all those who are aware of the problems that the country has gone through in, in the last years. But thank you very much, uh, Senator uh, David Colton. We appreciate your patience and time with us on this show. Thank <laughs> you.